All right, how you doing? My name is Dr. Raymond Carson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also an assistant professor. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing. Go ahead, sir, introduce, introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ernie Stevens. Thank you, Ernie Stevens, for being here. One thing I want to uh, highlight is that there was a HBO documentary conducted in San Antonio, and you had the pleasure, along with your partner, being in it. Could you go ahead and talk a little bit about that and how that came about? Absolutely. The, uh, the documentary is called Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. And it centers around uh, the unique kind of, um, I want to say, department or unit that we have here on the, on the San Antonio Police Department within the mental health unit. So really what happened was in 2008, uh, I was one of the first officers asked to be on a mental health unit here in San Antonio. The department never had one prior to that. And it was me and one other officer. And um, within about a year or so, we ended up getting two more officers and Joe became my partner. Well, we started to get a little bit of local media attention about the mental health unit and our approach to the community and how we um, you know, use a human approach and look for treatment rather than incarceration for somebody that's in a mental health crisis. Well, that story got to a writer by the name of Ann Snyder from The Atlantic, and she came down and wrote an article called Policing with Velvet Gloves. And that story uh, went national, and ABC News Nightline with Byron Pitts uh, contacted us and came down and wanted to do a ride along. So he did, and then he ran that story three times in one year because of the multiple police shootings involving individuals with mental health uh, diagnoses that were unarmed. And that story got out to the director, Jen McShane, who was friends actually with Ann Snyder, the writer from The Atlantic. And she came down and said that she wanted to do a ride along with Joe and I and that she was a filmmaker. Uh, but she showed up with no camera, no crew. And I, I was wondering what kind of filmmaker is this, you know? But, you know, in all honesty, she just wanted to kind of get to know me and Joe and see if there was even going to be a story there. And I remember her first ride along. Uh, we responded to a group home where there was an individual that was having some homicidal ideations. He wanted to stab and kill his roommate. And, uh, you know, we talked to him for a little while and we were able to de-escalate him. And you know, the, the idea was, let's go ahead and get him help, which he agreed to. And as we're walking towards our vehicle, and mind you, we're in plain clothes in an unmarked car, but the, the car looks like a police car, but without the markings on it. Uh, you know, he took one look at that and said, well, I'm not gonna ride in the back of that police car. So I said, okay, well, you know, would you feel more comfortable just riding in the front? And he said, yeah, that's fine. And the director of the film kind of grabbed me by the arm and pulled me back. I said, you're gonna let him ride up front? And I said, yes. And she goes, why would you do that? I'm like, well, why wouldn't I do that? He's not under arrest. He's, he's just a, pa he's a patient. He needs a ride to a treatment facility. And being that she was from up in the New York area, that, that kind of approach, I guess, is unheard of up there. So she saw right there, I think there's a story here, and it goes deeper than just officers responding to calls of mental health. There's actually a human connection taking place and, and a show of humanity, dignity, and respect to those that have mental health issues. So uh, she filmed for three years. Uh, she, wow. brought, she brought a camera crew this time and a sound man and a project manager and everybody. And for three years, you know, she followed us to church. She followed us to school, you know, to our hobbies. She was just just really embedded in our lives for three years. And the film was released at South by Southwest in 2019. And it won the Grand Jury Award there for uh, Empathy and Craft. And that set us on a long year of film festivals where the documentary just continued to win over and over and over again. And, and HBO purchased the film and it's now since been released on HBO. Wow, congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, just for the human connection, that's something that's very much needed in today's time. And uh, thank you and Joe. And I know there's other officers out there like you two are doing right now. And I'm just saying a heartfelt, a heartfelt thank you. Seriously. Right. You're welcome. It's, it's actually an honor to serve. It really is. So I want to ask in that regard, being uh, and having the position that you have right now in the state of Texas, can you give us an understanding of what it's like right now with the relationship between law enforcement and the community? 
Well, what I thought it was and what it is, is two, two different things. And what I mean by that was, you know, in San Antonio, I've always felt that we've had a very good connection with our community. Uh, we get along very well. And in most part, we really do. Uh, however, in, in recent events taking place with the civil unrest in the, in the murder of George, George Floyd, um, you know, there was some, some protests and demonstrations that took place here. Well, my assignment during those protests was to go undercover into the crowd as a protester to kind of be the eyes and ears, you know, of what was going on in case there was going to be, you know, any plans of damage or assaults taking place on people. And what I, what I found was that there is a part of the community here that is hurting legitimately uh, and has concerns about the police department and the teachings involved with the police department. Um, you know, I was watching people cry. I was watching people, uh, you could see the pain. You could feel their pain. And for a while, I'll be honest with you, I, was, I forgot I was an officer and I got caught up so emotionally charged in what was going on that, you know, I said, you know what, I want to be a part of this change. And I'm on the inside of it, on the police department. I have a huge role in the training that takes place. And, you know, I'm listening to what the community is saying. And I want to be a part of this solution. And so what I thought and what reality was, was two different things. I want to emphasize a little bit on what you said about the heart of the community. What do you think? What did, what did you take from that? What did you glean from that? Like the, the voice, that heart of the community? What do you think that, that conclusion was? For me, the conclusion was that there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between the community and the police department. And I don't think it's a huge chasm, you know, but I definitely don't think we, we as police are doing enough to inform and educate the community to how we police. Because a lot of the things I heard the community asking for, we already do, but we're not doing a good job educating them on what we do. So a lot of that is just communication, but also a lot of that is antiquated training. You know, police departments have trained the same way for years and years and years, and they've introduced some new concepts and some new technology, but really it's foundational law and defensive tactics. And then they kind of set you loose where I think we need to look at recruiting what we're doing there and look at the training in the academy because there, there are some changes that can be made, I think, for the better. Understood. I want to go back to something you talked about earlier as you were introducing and speaking about the video, the documentary. Mental health. Can you go into right now from whence you started to right now to this point, how that has affected the community? How do you feel that you have contributed in a positive way through the mental health uh, unit? Well, I got educated, um, you know, and I started to see other people's perspective. And I think that is key to every citizen encounter. Are you willing to see their perspective? Not just because the law is black and white. You can show up all day long and says, well, the law says this. The problem with that is humanity is all different color, right? So there's no one answer when dealing with one particular person. I think you really need to take the time to listen to the perspective, use procedural justice during the process of that you know, encounter, no matter what the outcome is. As long as you have been fair in the process, you're gonna, you're gonna feel like that you were transparent and that you were authentic in dealing with that individual. Now, when it comes to mental health, the way I look at that in responding now is you know when a paramedic responds to a call, they always put on gloves because they assume that you may be dealing with somebody that has a communicable disease. For me, when I respond now, I have to assume that whoever I'm dealing with has experienced some level of trauma in their life. And if I can go in there with that type of mindset and be willing to listen and receive what they wanna tell me, also be transparent and vulnerable in my life on how we can make a connection, I think, you know, overall, you'll see police departments do a much better job in dealing with the community. Understood. I need to touch on a very touchy subject, and you spoke about it um, a little earlier. The George Floyd uh, situation with the officer. And seem, it seems as though in America, and maybe across the world, that it sparked. Uh, that was a spark that kind of lit a fire in America. Uh, how did that make you feel, uh, if you can from your personal perspective? 
Yeah. So what you saw in this incident was, you know, after after the and I'm just gonna call it what it is, after the murder of George Floyd, you saw police departments, police officers from around the country. You know, the normal response is, well, let me see the whole video. Let's let me know what happened prior to that eight minutes and 46 seconds. You know, you didn't see that this time. You saw the community of law enforcement come together and say that was wrong. You know, and that's the first time I've seen this happen in, in my career that all law enforcement came on and said that needs to be addressed. That's wrong. How that made me feel, I think, is we're also very hypocritical. And what I mean by that is in the murder of George Floyd, people saw that and the vicarious trauma that was caused by that was a community um, outrage at the police. You know, all police are bad. We are our own worst enemies. Do we not do the same thing? You know, when, they, when, they, when you see on social media that an officer got a coffee from Starbucks with the word pig written on it, do they not go to social media and say, ban Starbucks, don't ever go there again? So we do the, we, we complain about the same things that we tolerate. And it's, it's uncalled for now. We have to take a look in the mirror and say, look, that perception from everybody that was outraged, we need to listen and pay attention. Yes, that's not everybody, but we do all play a part in our, in our encounters with, with citizens every single day. And we have to, and we must be better. When situations like this occur in the country, with your experience, and when you see civil unrest in Minneapolis and Seattle, where they're going into the police department and tearing it down and you see the rioting, now, we're saying minus the protesters. We, we're not talking about protesters who are peacefully protesting. We're talking about these individuals who are going out there purposely destroying property and so forth. Uh, how does that affect the San Antonio area or the police department? Do you have discussions about it? Do you prepare for it? What is the procedures for that? There we go. I got you. I just now got you back. I lost the uh, question. What was that? So when you have civil unrest in the community, when you have situations like Minneapolis, Seattle, uh, when you have minus the protesters, minus those individuals who are out there peacefully protesting, those people who are out there destroying property physically, purposely doing stuff like that, how does that affect the San Antonio area? Do, do the police departments have uh, meetings? Do they have discussions? Is there preparations? Can you go into a little bit about that? Sure. So the night of the the original large protest, which was uh, scheduled on a Saturday night when I think six, six to 7,000 people showed up. We had a very large briefing. Um, state police came in to help us out. I think 70 of them showed up. Um, you know, the, the chief did tell us, hey guys, you know, they're not gonna, you know, nobody's gonna burn our city down. Uh, and we really need to limit whatever kind of property damage there is. However, you will maintain your professionalism at all times. That's not gonna be a question. And he made it very clear. Um, after the damage and destruction took place that night, you have to, you kind of have to peel back the layers. Like who, who really was involved in that? You know, it happened after I feel the peaceful protest because I marched in the protest. And when we uh, disbanded or most of the majority of the people left the Travis Park area, a lot of them went home. We had some people come over and begin to instigate and yell, hey, you know, let's, let's go charge the Alamo. Um, which wasn't going to happen. It didn't work out 300 years ago. It wasn't going to happen again, right? Yeah. Um, but then they were <laughs> like, "Let's break into the uh, let's break into River Center Mall," and, and so you know there was a um, there was an attitude there of violence and destruction that was starting to show itself. And uh, you know the police department quickly had to dispatch extra help and kind of quell that and really minimize the damage. And thank goodness they did. But the result of that was now we need to sit down and talk about what changes need to be made because, you know, even though it's a minority um, voice that's out there against the silent majority, it's still a voice and it needs to be heard. So we've had two different town hall meetings, uh, one in-person meeting, I think, I, I believe it's actually taking place today. And it's an opportunity for the police department and the community to, to come together. I think the mayor... Uh, showed up one day out there and he made a statement. Uh, the chiefs addressed City Hall several times trying to find out, look, what, how can we do things better? Uh, they're talking about new initiatives that eight can't wait. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's 
uh, eight different levels of use of force that can be checked before deadly force is used, right? So, which a lot of that we already have in place, but again, we do a poor job, I believe, of educating and informing the community of exactly what we do here in San Antonio. Um, I was discouraged to see how some of the people here in San Antonio reacted because again, with my rose colored glasses, I thought we had a really good relationship uh, with, San, with the community here in San Antonio. But the demographics of the people were different. Um, it was a very young crowd. Um, you know, just, it was just different. It wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. I saw people of all different ages. A lot of them were younger kids. A lot of them were causing problems and, and breaking things with skateboards and just a, t- a type of damage was taking place that I've never seen before. And it was all up and down the, you know, Houston Street and around by the Alamo. And uh, it was sad to see because now when you drive down there, everything's boarded up and it doesn't look like a tourist town. Mm. You know, it looks like a war zone down there that, that happened. And it's, it's discouraging. Understood. With all that being said, and being that the world is de- dealing with a pandemic, COVID-19, uh, this is kind of a two-part question. So was there concern during the protest uh, with COVID-19? And then how has COVID-19 affected your ability to do your job when you deal with individuals from a mental health aspect? A good question. So during the, the protest, uh, COVID had just hit its peak and was starting to go back down. So you saw people getting a little bit more lax. Most of the people were wearing masks, but overall, People were still way too close to each other. Social distancing uh, was out the window. People were packed together on the street. And it was really difficult, uh, even for the line officers that, that lined up in front of the Alamo and the mall. People were right in their face yelling and screaming. And you, you've got to maintain your professionalism. So, you know, people were put at risk during that, and especially a large gathering like that. Where I've seen COVID really take a toll for me personally is my response to the community when somebody's in a mental health crisis, especially with adolescents. Because here I am showing up, even though I'm in plain clothes, I've got a mask on, I've got gloves on, and it's scary, you know, because back in the day, you didn't wear a mask unless you're going in to rob somebody, right? So now you're showing up on their doorstep with a mask and gloves on, and and somebody's already in a crisis. And now, so I always take a few steps back and say, do you want me to put my mask down? We just have to stay far enough apart we're not a danger, but I want you to be able to see me um, and be able to communicate with you because I know that body language uh, and nonverbal is such an important part of establishing rapport, uh, especially when you're dealing with a mental health crisis. So it's been a huge barrier. uh, And just the statistics I've seen lately is the mental health issue here just around the country is going to spike because of the pandemic, because of the civil unrest, because of the unemployment. It's, It's going to really get up there and we're going to need to do a better job and be prepared for that. Understood. I want everybody to please, who's watching this video, who will be watching this video, watch the HBO documentary, Ernie and Joe. It is a pleasure. It is insightful and you will enjoy it. So now I want to ask the question because I watched the video. This question comes directly from the video. What do you have? What is innately inside of you that allows you to or keeps you to maintain your job and and your standard and your stability as you go forth in the community? Well, I've seen the response that we've had from the community. You know, when, see, people don't, people don't care how much you know. It doesn't matter how many letters I got behind my name, if I've got a master's, a doctor's degree, they don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care, right? So, and I've seen the response from the community. When I actually let myself be real and take my own mask off of, hey, I'm Superman, uh, Mr. Policeman, and actually put that aside and say, no, I'm Ernie. And I need to know who you are. I need you to remove your mask also and quit hiding behind everything's okay. And let me actually see you for who you are at the moment. You don't have to hide with me. You don't have to pretend with me. And you certainly don't have to fear me. I've seen that. I've seen the response I get. And I've seen people, you know, get get into treatment and do well and recover. And it's all, I think it starts with that approach. Are you, are you willing to be human in that approach instead of so robotic as an officer of what you learn in the academy and you come out and, and things just seem to go routinely and you almost, it's almost robotic 
where you lose that human connection of, hey, this is another individual that's going through a hard time right now. And if I can make a connection, maybe I can help them see that treatment is possible and viable for them. And then, you know, have the resources available to help out. And one, and one more thing on that documentary. So um, they just, HBO just released it free right now on YouTube through July 15th. So, you know, that, that was huge for HBO to do that. Uh, especially when you're seeing shows like Cops and Live PD get canceled. You know, they, they brought this to the forefront and put it on such a large platform right now. That's very good to hear. Yeah. Seeing that mental health is now a structure, a unit within the San Antonio Police Department, have you seen a shift? Because now officers are required 40 hours of mental health training. So what kind of shift or what kind of positive changes have, have occurred due to that? Well, actually, so the 40-hour CIT training that we do here, in 2018, the Sandra Bland Act happened, and the Senate Bill 1850 was passed requiring an additional 40 hours in order for you to move up in your Texas Peace Officer's License. In order to get an intermediate, advanced, or master's peace officer's license, you now have to take the 1850 course, which is an additional 40 hours. So every officer on the San Antonio Police Department is now going to be required to have 80 hours of mental health training. Now, where I've seen that work to our advantage is when we started the training for everybody in 2010, Chief McManus said, I want all 100% of officers responding of, of our department to be CIT trained. We were averaging about 250 involuntary emergency detentions a month, right? Where we have to take somebody against their will and place them into treatment. Now that we have 100% of our department trained, we are averaging 1,300 emergency detentions a month, mm. which tells me that the, the officers on the unit now have been educated to know what mental health looks like, what it sounds like, how it presents, and know that there's a better option, right, than, than an improper incarceration. There's a better value in this training by getting that person into treatment. So we've seen that, you know, fivefold now in hospitalizations of patients, which I'm ecstatic about, you know, you know, because how many in the past were we either leaving, not doing anything for, or improperly incarcerating, because that's all we knew how to do, right? Yeah. So I, I've seen a huge shift within the department. That's good, that's very good to hear. With the, and I'm kind of shifting the subject right now, just kind of shifting back, so with the civil unrest in the, in the community and everything that's going on from the George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and other situations like that occurring, has there been a shift that you may have seen in the San Antonio community? N not yet. I have sat down with a few people to have this discussion. And I've sat down with people within our own department because I want to know their views. You know, we have a, we have a, a gentleman, a black gentleman on our unit. And I wanted to talk to him and have that uncomfortable conversation with him. Um, I don't know if you've seen the video by Emmanuel Acho, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man on YouTube, but it's incredible. And I used that platform to start this conversation with him. And I said, you know, with everything going on, um, you know, you being a, a Black man, a police officer, how's that affected you? And his response floored me. He said, you know, Ernie, I had to give up my Black card years ago when I went to college and became a police officer. And I didn't understand what that meant. I said, you're going to have to explain that to me. And he broke it down. You know, he told me about, hey, we had no role models. We had no mentors. We didn't have a career day. The only people that showed up was the military when they came recruiting. And we got into this deep conversation. And it, it was almost like, man, he's giving me a whole lesson on urban psychology that I didn't, that I didn't know. And so to learn just it, the community itself we need to really get there. We need to do a lot better job because I'm just now having these conversations with officers within the department. You know, I can't wait to have these conversations with members of the community uh, because I think we have so much potential here in San Antonio. It seems like whenever we have some type of crisis here, we always rise above. When, when COVID hit, the food bank and, and, our, and our grocery stores here, just incredible kind of response. I believe that the community will have that same response in regards to or response to the civil unrest. We can come together. We can do a better job. And, and I, I know me, my own, myself, I speak for myself, I'll do my part 
to be a better human being for sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. When you see situations with the George Floyd and officer, the, the way that transpired, how does that make officers feel? How does that make you feel? I don't want you to speak for officers. How does that make you feel as an officer when you see that happen to another? Well, when you see that happen in that manner, how does that make you feel? Oh, disgusted, outraged. Because, you know, I, I served on the Chief's Advisory Action Board here, which meant that I reviewed officers' misconduct and I would give out uh, a recommendation for punishment and that would get forwarded to the Chief's office. We all was on that board. And on most cases, the police officers always gave a harsher punishment than the civilians. Which tells, which tells me, and this happened more than 80% of the time, that police officers don't want to be associated with other bad police officers. They don't want to do it because we, you know, we're trying to portray ourselves as servants within the community. And when somebody sets a bad example like that, it makes everybody else look bad. You know, and, and then we take all these steps backwards when it's hard enough just to take one step forward. Well. That's a mouthful in itself. I, I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you. I, I can't say enough words, especially after watching that documentary. I want to ask this last question. Do you have anything that you would like to impart into the community, for the community to know, for them to understand, for them to be educated? What would you like to say? Well, I would like to say first, foremost, thank you for allowing myself the opportunity to serve you. Uh, I wake up every day um, with that desire to go out and make this community a better place. And I think most police officers do. I really do. Um, you know, we, we've got to do a better job communicating with each other. I want the community to know that we're, we're going above and beyond when it comes to training here for mental health response, for de-escalation and communication. You know, we're so far above other places that they come and visit here to find out why do y'all have such a low use of force? Um, also involved shootings. We're, we're at a very low rate here in San Antonio compared to other places. And the, and the community may not know that, but we, we get these visits all the time. So I want the community to feel safe if they need to call the police department. I want them you know, to know that you know, we're going to do our best at always trying to be professional. I'm, I'd love to uh, run a class on procedural justice and professionalism. I think these are on the way, especially when you look at the president's uh, reform bill that he put out. We do respond to co-responder method with mental health professionals that are within our unit. We have three clinicians. So we're, we are doing a good job here. And I don't want the community to lose faith. I'm not going to lose faith in the community. And I just ask that you do your part and don't lose faith in us. Thank you. That will conclude the interview in itself.